I don't know what we're doing, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> oh, it's the story of my life. <laughs> oh, we're recording. We're recording. We're Welcome recording. back, everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Science Actually Presents the Nerd and the Scientist, um, the show where you can come each week to hear uh, two people who are both nerds and both approximately scientists talking about whatever space-related topics that have decided to cross our tiny Aww. brains Aww. this week. I'm kind of a scientist. Thanks, man. <laughs> I, I remember I wrote, I wrote an article last year for some uh, public outreach thing, and I wrote astrophysicist and then brackets in training. And, uh, and, and one of the other PhD students in, in my research group had said to me, like, the only real difference between being an astrophysicist and a PhD student is just like how much you're getting paid and how long you've been doing it for. Like you're still, you're doing science, right? So you are still an astrophysicist, just like a baby astrophysicist. Totes and dorbs. That's a kid's say. Totes. <laughs> Totes. Uh, <sighs> how are you doing on this fine morning slash afternoon slash whatever time it is in the u.s today i'm doing okay i'm doing all right i'm a little cold but i have a blanket as you can see and i'm feeling fine everything's good how you doing Kyle? i'm i'm good i was wondering what that blanket was I, you know i come in and i see uh, this kind of like a whitish grayish stripe like draped across benjamin's chest i'm like oh he, he's dressed like a it's like a toga. It's like a I'm grease. recording from a toga party, and uh, <laughs> I'm three sheets to the wind, my friend. Let's get going. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes. Uh, in the previous episode, um, which you may or may not have listened to, we were speaking about and you should um, some, as you should. You should stop right now. Stop everything except breathing, and go back and listen to the previous episode before listening to this one, and then listen to this one. Um, while continuing to breathe throughout the entire process, um, the nerd and the scientist does not condone the stopping of breathing in order to listen to our episodes. Just have to have that out there as a yep. disclaimer. It's important to say. <laughs> yeah. But yes, Benjamin, what are you excited to talk about on today's episode? Uh, I thought I would like to talk about one of my favorite constellations, the big blue woman. Sorry, is this an Avatar reference? I don't get it. No, it's not an Avatar reference. Um, it's one of my favorite constellations. It's one of the constellations that everyone can most easily pick out in the night sky. It's the big blue woman. What? Who? Who is? Who is she? What is the this? Dakota people of <laughs> the, the Native American group of uh, uh, or tribe of the Dakotas mm -hmm. looked at the Big Dipper, and they saw a big blue woman. We see the Big Dipper, but they saw something completely different, which I huh. find fascinating, hard C. Uh, <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, the Western culture, we all are familiar, or most of us are anyway, with the, some of the constellations that we know of. Taurus the Bull, or Orion, or the Big Dipper, or mm, the Unicorn. Crux, or Southern Crust, or whatever. Uh, the Milky Way across the sky, if you can see it. Uh, we all know what they are, and we all have our very common names for them. But those are not the only names for them, as humanity has a great variety of cultures with different belief systems. Mm -hmm. And they all have their own interpretations of some of these uh, constellations. Yeah, I think it's um, it's an unfortunate result of history that most people in the Western world tend to, you know, think of the constellations. And I guess also the, the astronomical community is um, somewhat at fault here as, as you know, largely uh, historically having been uh, done by, um, you know, old white dudes in, in Europe. Um, most of the constellations and, and a lot of things in space are generally named after the, these Western uh, traditions and, you know, Western classifications, um, or at least, you know, within the European world. But yeah, as you're saying, you know, um, Native American groups, um, you know, uh, indigenous, uh, you know, Aboriginal and First Nations people here in Australia, um, there are, you know, in, in uh, all across 
China uh, and, and all across the world, like there are different cultures who have different perspectives. And, um, you know, if making a constellation is basically the equivalent of, you know, pointing up at a cloud and saying, hey, that looks like a bunny or, you know, whatever shape, it's, it's very subjective. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting to see different cultures coming up with different, uh, you know, images, you know, an example you gave Big Dipper versus Big Blue Woman. It's also interesting to, to me, at least, to hear about the stories that go with the constellations, right? Mm. And how they talk to the, the culture. Pardon me? There are, there are some fantastic stories that go with it. Um, some of the, the Milky Way one, uh, there is, it's called the Milky Way uh, because of Greek and Roman cultures. Uh, their belief was the breast milk of their primary goddess when she gave birth to the world her breast milk shot across the sky and thus the milky way but another one i found uh in several native american cultures uh they had a story that when the universe and the world was created the night sky was put up there and the stars were put up there evenly spread out across the sky and then some young coyotes came and being playful as young coyotes are they made a mess of things and that mess that they left you can see where they played that's the milky way and they call it where the coyotes played and i love that story because it's so completely different <laughs> huh. instead of uh, uh they're both first of all they're both a mess you know squirting milk across the sky or bunch of coyotes messing up the order of the stars so they're both messes <laughs> but the origins are completely unique and different and yeah. i love I mean, it with uh here in australia yeah there's a whole a whole different thing uh with the milky way um so so with um a lot of aboriginal and first nations astronomy it's not as much kind of connecting dots uh, of the stars to you know make a shape but rather looking for large um, shadowy regions, so you know, in the case mm -hmm. of the Milky Way, it's that kind of really dense, dusty um, dust lane in, in the middle of the Milky Way, um, and kind of taking that as the shape. And so, a, a lot of these cultures here refer to that shape as uh, the Great Emu, because if you kind of look at it, there's like this larger clump um, connected to an elongated section with another small clump at the end around where the uh, the coal sack nebula is. Um, and so what's interesting about the great emu, um, at least the great emu, um, at least in, uh, Wiradjuri culture, which is, you know, one of these, um, indigenous cultures, uh, here in Australia. Um, so it's not just the story, you know, around it being a great emu, but it's also critically connected to their culture in terms of, uh, hunting and gathering emu eggs, right? So what you would actually have is a situation where they can track whether or not it's the right time of year to be hunting for emu eggs based on whether the great emu is, you know, by the horizon at that time of year or whether it's up in the center of the sky. Um, and that will tell you whether or not it's the right time to be gathering emu eggs. So there's a lot of, yeah, cultural astronomy. Super interesting. Love that. Love that. Um, when speaking about how it's not just shapes in the sky, um, Orion, the mm -hmm. great hunter, has so many different uh, it's it's it, different interpretations across cultures. Um, but one of them, uh, another Native American interpretation, by the Inuits, uh, or nor that's why that's more northern, I think. Um, they didn't look at all of Orion as a constellation, but rather they looked at Orion's belt, those three primary stars, and they completely ignored the middle one. Their cult, their constellation was just the two edges, ends of the belt. And that was it. No line connecting them. And those two are just two people placed very far apart from one another. And that's the entire story of it. It's just it, to, to this one culture, it looked like two people separated by a great distance. 
I wonder that if does, there's I, a reason it's why a simple one. Hmm? I wonder if there's a reason why they didn't have that middle star, like an astronomical reason. I should look for it more, but I just thought so, that was an interesting inter, uh, inter, uh, uh, I lost the word. It's, um, it's interesting. So the, um, I think almost, uh, every, you know, cause, cause Australia historically, um, you know, was home to, to dozens, if not hundreds of, of different, um, Aboriginal peoples. Right. And what's interesting is that amongst all of these different cultures, there were stories that connected Orion or, or the hunter to the Pleiades, right? Um, the seven sisters and mm -hmm. the, this idea of Orion being a man or a hunter and the Pleiades being seven sisters or seven girls who were being chased by the hunter. That's and that exists, yeah, across like multiple different cultures. And what's really interesting is that um, a lot of the um, Aboriginal lore about this always refers to it as seven sisters, despite there only being six stars. If I'm getting that the right way around. And so what's interesting is that one of the stars in the Pleiades constellation, you know, astronomers modern day have actually discovered is a variable star, right? It's brightness changes over time. And that information is contained within the stories of these people, right? Huh. They, they talk about one of the sisters being chased away by the hunter. And so these stories, you know, from generation to generation, you know, Aboriginal culture is something that's existed in Australia for like, you know, 65,000 years. It's tracked, like the, the stories themselves actually contain information about the science, about the actual astronomy which I don't know. I just find fascinating. You think it's possible that going back not too long ago, there was no light pollution from big cities. We take the, the grand time scale of civilization. Mm -hmm. You think it's possible on a good, we spoke about this in our previous episode about what makes good seeing. Um, you think it's possible back then with the naked eye, it was, they could have seen some, fluctuation in brightness in the Pleiades? I, I think so, yeah. I'm, I'm actually inclined to think that. Um, I think that's one of the big dangers of, of light pollution in Australia is that so much of the, um, the heritage and the, the, you know, the, what's called the, the dream time, which is um, the Aboriginal and First Nations um, kind of uh, story and culture, that is so connected to the sky and they can no longer connect to the sky in the same way because of light pollution. But, but yeah, I think it's definitely possible that they would have been able to see and track and, you know, pass that down from generation to generation. Absolutely. That's fantastic. That's yeah. also funny that they refer to it as dream time because in Indian culture, they also do that as well. Their huh. God, their God Brahma mm -hmm. supposedly we are living right now in Brahma's dream. He dreams the universe. And that's, and we're currently in this, we are existing currently in his current dream of the universe. He'll wake up and then he'll go back to sleep and that will be the next universe. So they actually dreamed, they actually had a culture that had beginnings and ends to the universe, <laughs> which is fascinating. It is interesting. And funny you should say that about Australia as far as light pollution goes because it's one of the least polluted, <laughs> least light pollution countries in the world. <laughs> yeah, definitely in the center of Australia. Yes. Uh, <laughs> be a great place to do some, some astrophotography. I'll get there oh, one day. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. On top of uh, what? Ayers Rock, or I'm sure it has another name now. Yeah, Uluru. Um, Uluru, yes, thank you. The the government has uh, prevented people from from climbing um, the the rock anymore because it's uh, because of its cultural significance. It's also the biggest singular rock on the planet, besides yeah. Dwayne Johnson. Second biggest rock <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> oh man. Oh, well, that about cool. brings us to today's uh, ad break. Uh, ad break. Yes. <laughs> Benjamin, you want to tell tell folks about today's sponsor? Sure. <laughs> Ever want to take a picture with the rock, but you can't afford them? It's considerably cheaper to fly to Australia and make your way all the way out to Uluru and take a picture with the rock, the biggest rock. <laughs> make your appointments now. Just <laughs> dial this number and book your passage to Australia and just wander around a bit. They love that there, wandering around. And you'll come across this incredibly beautiful massive reddish rock just sticking up out of the ground it is the biggest singular rock on the planet it's just it's not a mountain it's it's a it is a giant rock single boulder massive thing and it's bigger than dwayne johnson it's bigger than dwayne johnson <laughs> with a lot less charisma. It just sits there and doesn't do much. Doesn't star in movies. Significantly less. Yeah. <laughs> so book your trip now to the actual rock. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like today's episode is accidentally sponsored by the Australian Tourism Department. <laughs> fine. Fine. I like Australia. Australia is cool. Never been, but I hear stories. <laughs> Oh, and uh, that brings us back to today's episode. Sure. Did you know about Taurus the bull? No. Yeah. I mean, that's I all. That's all I gotta say. It is a constellation, Taurus the bull. We all know of, or many of us heard of Taurus the bull, and it's actually one of the most popular uh, constellations because so many cultures, going back thousands of years were practiced in uh, worshiping a bull. Um, Asian cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, Greek cultures, European cultures, they knew of bulls as a sign of strength, and they often saw in Taurus those, that same constellation, they saw the shape of a bull. But uh, it also has some of the great, uh, greatest uh, like diversions from a bull, which I thought was interesting. Um, in the Tucanu people, saw a grill specifically one that's cooking fish and Tongans saw pigeons on a perch. Uh, the Norse gods or the Norse people rather saw the mouth of a wolf God. Um, Maori culture saw ship sails. The Inuits saw a group of dogs. Uh, Chinese culture saw a large net and the Burong people saw a cockatoo. So, the variations are rich and they're amazing and I love it. Yeah, it definitely goes back to what we were saying before about how, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of subjective in a way that you might decide to, to, you know, connect the dots between these stars that for the most part don't actually, like they're not connected. They're at different distances, different types of stars they're moving in different directions. I think, um, like Pleiades specifically is, mm -hmm. you know, Seven Sisters does happen to be a group of stars that are around the same age and, and, and are somewhat, you know, um, spatially related. But yeah, the rest of them are just completely like abstract and arbitrarily associated. Yeah. The, the, the Pleiades are, are a fascinating thing because as you've mentioned, the cultures see that see, the cultures that see a very similar story in them. The cultures themselves are separated from each other by thousands of miles, and hundreds of years of time. They're not connected to each other, but they still see the same story in that one little constellation. I think it's incredible. It's some, something happened. That's proof that there were aliens here. I think... Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to to see like how much of this stuff actually survives long term, right? Because the constellations will change over they will. the time scale, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Um, I saw a video of what happens to the Big Dipper. Um, the Big Dipper is a very large constellation that we're very familiar with, but spatially, it's also incredibly huge as well. 
Um, when we look at the constellations, we're looking at the night sky and we draw a very two-dimensional picture, connect the dots picture on the stars that we see. But some of those stars are in reality close to us and some of them are insanely far away from us. Some of those stars are actually galaxies, which are even further away. Um, but the Big Dipper has a great variety of incredible distances from us. Some are very close to the stars, some are very far away. And in a matter of, and as far as ast astronomical timescales go, I think it's something like, uh, like 10,000 years or so, the Big Dipper is just going to stretch its, stretch out and be completely unrecognizable to what it is today because things are, all, all these pictures that we put on the constellations are dependent on where these stars are today. <laughs> these stars are all moving incredibly fast in incredibly different directions usually. <laughs> and so... Yep. It won't just be the, the big blue woman. It'll be like the very like giraffe like blue woman. <laughs> then it'll be like Avatar. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, wow, ten thousand years. That's that's um crazy. I'm probably wrong in the number, but it is uh they are well they are all moving right now. They are all distorting right now. They are all be very slowly by human standards. But I mean, everything's moving. On that time scale, we'll we'll also probably lose the ability to have total solar eclipses, right? Because the the moon is mm -hmm. moving away from Earth; it's drifting away from Earth in right. its orbit by you know a, a like couple of inch year. every year, mm -hmm. and it's you know the only reason that we can have a total solar eclipse is that <clears throat> the moon passes in front of the sun, and you know the moon is like. In terms of how how big it appears on the sky, it's about three hundred times smaller than you know the sun uh, physically, but it's three hundred times closer. Mm -hmm. So so their size on the sky appears to be uh, roughly the same, but as the moon moves further and further away, its size, as we see it from Earth, will get smaller and smaller. So it will not be able to uh, cover the entire sun after a mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it'll be uh, the ring of fire, as it's called, when the moon is directly between your eyesight and the sun. Uh, that ring will get thicker and thicker and thicker because the moon will be farther and farther away, therefore putting a smaller and smaller black dot in front of the sun. Yeah, it's it, that's happening. So go see an eclipse if you can. Yeah, there's one happening. If you missed the one that just happened in North America last week, uh, there's another one coming in April. It's going to mm -hmm. be chewing right through the the Midwest, the South. East, I think. Hmm? That's going to go through sure. like the Southern oh, States. Well. It's going to go through the Southern States, up towards the Northeast. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or is, if, yes. Think the, yes. Um, the line of totality definitely goes through um, upstate New York and mm -hmm. through Vermont um, and that kind of part of the US. So definitely check that out. I think the next one in Australia is not until like 2028. I hope you're there. I hope you make it. Oh, man, it's, it's such a cool feeling actually seeing an eclipse. And that's another thing. I mean, we could probably do a whole episode on how culturally eclipses have been interpreted by different cultures throughout history. Absolutely. And even misused too, I think, as a people who knew too, I think, as a people who knew that the eclipses were coming and those that did not, and then those that did knew say, Behold my power. <laughs> oh man. I and mean, that'd be a trip, right? If you think that the sun is literally a god and <laughs> the god has predictable behavior, and somebody says, Ah, I will block out the sun. Mind blowing. Yeah. How awesome would that be? Ugh. Ugh. Superman did that once. What was that, Superman 4? Yeah, pushed the, the moon in front of the sun. Or was that the atomic guy that did it? 
Doesn't matter. It was a horrible movie. Pretend I didn't say anything. Do not watch Superman 4 with Christopher Reeves. Just stop after the Richard Pryor one and then move on. It's a good, 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 good piece of advice. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> oh, man. This is... um. This has been good looking into cultural astronomy and and looking into um you know an understanding of the constellations and and how important it is you know following from what we spoke about in the previous episode to maintain dark skies to have places uh, like we have in a cut in there's one spot in australia i know that there are a few spots around the world that have you know protected dark skies um it's important to preserve this stuff because not only are there you know important cultural implications, but just like the pale blue dot and, and, you know, having this kind of cosmic perspective, it's important to be able to look out into space, you know, for humanity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I forget the name of the island, uh, but a good friend of science, actually, the Guernsey scientist. Hello, Liz. Uh, she shared with me, uh, and she shared with the entire internet for those who are online, if you take a good look, um, she was on an Island and I forget the name of the Island. Gosh, darn it. But it was the first, uh, uh, dark, dark sky Island. Uh, very few people live there and there are no cars and there are, I think very few streetlights, if any, and they're dark. They're like, they're, I think, amber color. And they are, it's just, when it comes time for nighttime, that's it. It's far away. It's in the middle of the ocean. There's no light on the island. And it's just beautiful. The sky is amazing. The uh, animals that live there, that, you know, some nocturnal animals uh, environment is not disturbed by human made lights. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautifully preserved, uh, well, beautifully preserved night sky, at least. I'm sure there's some things that have been tinkered with, but as far as the light goes, it's, it's dark and it's pretty. I love that sentence. As far as, as far as light goes, it's dark. <laughs> Well, yeah, darkness is pretty. If you look at stars, it's all good, baby. That's true. Hey, that, that's how I got into this. You know, I was um, <clears throat> I was giving this uh, uh, public talk the other day uh, to a bunch of school kids, and and one of the kids was asking me, you know, how I how I got into space, how I fell in love with space, and it was just literally looking up, you know, being in a dark sky spot, having you know, a piece of equipment that amplifies starlight and just seeing thousands of stars and just being overwhelmed by it. So definitely recommend folks get out there and and see the stars and experience some of this themselves. Yes, absolutely. Or I remember a, uh, speaking of constellations, um, I remember a little homework assignment I got as a kid, Uh, make your own constellations, go outside, look at the sky, what pictures do you see? Just like you mentioned before, Kavi, you look at a cloud and I see a bunny or I see this. So you can do the exact same thing with uh, uh, the night sky. I believe it was fifth grade. Mrs. Lamb, I think was her name. I did not like her very much, this teacher. But she did have this uh, homework assignment where she said, just go look at the night sky and tell us what constellations you see. And that was a very fun ex- uh, experience. Just take your time. Enjoy. It's nice. It was, um listening who are curious to you know experience and and see some of this and and maybe if you don't necessarily have the ability to get out and look at the stars um yourself um i would recommend downloading um stellarium or or there's an Mm -hmm. online version i think as well of a program called stellarium um and stellarium actually has an option to um you know you can see all of the night sky and you can change where you're looking from and what time of day it is and you can go back in time and forward in time to see the motion of the planets and the stars and the galaxies and you can toggle the constellations on or off but there's also a setting to change which constellations you see whether you see that the 
the standard Western, um, you know, European constellations or whether you see the Chinese constellations or the um, Aboriginal constellations. Um, so highly, highly recommend checking that out and having a play around with that. Um, it's good fun. Stellarium, people. I'm going to go play with it now. <laughs> well, as soon as you sign off. Yeah. Um, on that note, this has been another episode of Science Actually Presents the Nerd and the Scientist. Uh, Benjamin, where can the good people find you? The good people can find me in California. But if you want to find me online, please go look up Science Actually on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Hive, Mastodon, Threads, TikTok, uh, Blue Sky, Facebook's the big one. And I'm also on LinkedIn because why not? How about you, Kavi? Um, yeah, just like Benjamin, you can find me at Fun Fact Science on all of the good procrastination platforms and also the bad ones. Um, I'll be there if you have any questions about the show, if you have questions about science, um, stuff that you want Benjamin and I to talk about more or stuff that you want us to talk Please. about less. Please be more. Please be the more category. <laughs> yes, uh, good listeners of this glorious podcast, do reach out to us. Tell us what you'd like to hear more about. We would absolutely give it a go um, because we're doing this for you. <laughs> just kidding. We're just doing it for ourselves. All right. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see you all next time. <laughs> We're having too much fun doing this. <laughs>